analytic tableau user group for on March. And so what is our tug about? So it's a little bit different because it's really dedicated to learning all about analytics only virtual. Yeah, almost every month. The only month that I have like function in Tableau, I can You're breaking up pretty bad. data, but it's really about this thematic. Uh, we didn't hear anything. Please, you if you have a job for me, please contact me. <laughs> so yes, I used to uh, work as a visual critic and animal monthly. I'm living in uh, Switzerland, and my patient our tableau chocolate and, uh, and my late dog, um, uh, co-leading the Data Women uh, Zuri group. In case that you want to join, please feel free to do so. It's also a free event and it's pro promote women working with, with our own data. So Prosam is the Tableau Visionary Social Ambassador. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, apart from this side, the, this nerdy side, uh, we have like a real, real. And then the ground rule for today, you just have to relax. Um, this event is being recorded because apparently I did, didn't uh, fall click on the record button. Uh, so you just have to enjoy um, the Q&A if uh, you have a question and use a chat section if you uh, just want to say hello or commenting on the good uh, speaker that we have to you today. Uh, please send us some love uh, in LinkedIn, in Twitter, saying that you like the analytic tableau user group. It's always a pleasure to receive that. Uh, so our agenda for today, we have the small welcome. Um, so that is the list that has been defined. So Timea will uh, start first and we will have Agatha. And last but not least, uh, Daniel. So I'm just checking uh, if uh, Prasam or Chimdi are here. Please, uh, please pick up. Otherwise, I will uh, go through uh, our amazing speakers. Yes. So let's go. So Timea, uh, I'll introduce very shortly Timea, and then uh, she will uh, start her presentation. Timea is an economist uh, turned data. Uh, and she has worked in business intelligence development for over 10 years. Currently, she is the head of data and platform in yeah, Inelheim. Sorry, I probably uh, mispronounced uh, um, uh, your company. That is a pharma company. Uh, and uh, because there is too much, and I cannot pronounce the H with my French accent. Uh, and Timia is a passion of the community. She has a platform, the In Tableau tool for creativity and productivity. And yeah, now the screen uh, is yours. <laughs> she will present. Uh, 
Uh, do you hear me, Annabelle? We didn't hear anything again. You're breaking up really badly. I will, I will introduce myself again. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'm trying, I will try to share my screen. Oh, <laughs> do you guys see my screen? Okay. We could see it, but now it disappeared. It disappeared. One more time. So sorry for breaking up. I lost uh, the Wi-Fi connection of my home and I was like giving me a power with my phone. <laughs> so. Okay, it came back. Um, hi guys, thank you for having me, Annabelle. Uh, I know this request already came last year, so I'm happy to make it. And I remembered it in my calendar. And um, who you guys who are celebrating very soon, happy Easter and have a nice... Uh, longer break hi prashan uh, so uh that's me and my love of my life my dog lily um she's equally a temple ambassador as i am because she's spending all the time in with me uh working so as annabelle showed i'm leading data and platforms in Böring and ingelheim it's a big pharma company based in germany however I'm responsible for eight countries out of Amsterdam. So I'm living in Amsterdam. Um, uh, very proudly, one of the uh, biggest achievements that I think so far is being a Tableau ambassador. Um, leading Data Plus Women in the Netherlands and also helping with the Tableau user group for the Netherlands time to time. Um, I always wanted to be a veterinarian or, 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 or a doctor. I never made it to the med school, so I became an economist. <laughs> um, and very strange, you know, life life brings you, universe, uh, destiny brings you to the place where you should be. Because in the last uh, six, seven years, I'm working in pharma, I'm working in veterinary science um, and uh, in pharmaceutical and life sciences. So you never know. You just have to put it out in the universe. It will come to you. Um, uh, also, I, I have my own website, dataunicorn.nl. Uh, uh, I sometimes, when I have time, I put content out there. And as a fun fact, in my previous life, I served as a diplomat. <laughs> I speak seven language, six languages. And actually, uh, I'm a coastal yacht master. So if the data thing doesn't work out, I can be your skipper. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, last year I've been into over 20 conferences this year I'm never gonna do that again because it's almost killed me but always the 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 tableau part is is the funnest uh of 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 these and also because the community and and we love each other so much and we support each other so it's always always fun and always good to see how is the what are the the newbies and what are the oldies are doing these days so this was very resonating with me in the journey, in, in the Tableau journey and, and all this analytical journey uh, when I started over 10 years ago. Um, this is the advice that I can give you uh, if you're starting your, your path. Uh, so it's, it's by Martin Luther King. Uh, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. There is so much to learn about data analytics and data visualization. And I'm going to share a ton of tools and a ton of opportunities. Don't get overwhelmed. I, in the beginning, in the beginning, I was always getting overwhelmed. Like I have to learn everything. I have to learn uh, how I'm going to able to uh, uh, harness all the tools and manage all these tools. You know, just a step by step. Don't get overwhelmed and, and reach out to the community. We are really happy to help you. 
so as you know, um, data visualization is a part of uh, uh, data storytelling. Uh, data storytelling has uh, six uh, main and key elements. And I'm going to bring, I'm trying to bring some tools for each of them. Um, it's uh, the key elements are audience, knowing your audience, uh, you are developing the dashboard to who. And I'm coming from, so I'm really would like to highlight that I'm coming from a business perspective this time. Uh, uh, I'm not coming like from an iron wheeze or, or a freelancer perspective that I'm creating some crazy artsy uh, design dashboards. I'm coming from what we do in, in, in business in, in, in real life. Uh, so very important to know your audience, which kind of level they have, which kind of um, background they have, interests and motivations. If they are, they are colorblind or what kind of data liter literacy level they have. And also creating narrative, uh, which should be clear in the beginning throughout the entire uh, dashboard experience until the end. Of course, data cleaning, we all, all, all this is a main, main uh, pain in the butt these days to clean and have real, uh, reliable data uh, uh, in, in the companies. Visuals, I'm going to bring many um, tools for how you can create a top notch and how can you have more creativity and play with visuals. Um, and also in order to deliver a really good data visualization and data storytelling, it has to make, it has to get some emotions out of you and also a uh, call for actions. Uh, because we can look at the dashboards and also business can look at the dashboards, but it, it has to mean something. It has to mean something to the business. Uh, look at the performance so they can act up uh, uh, upon the, the numbers and, and what we want to uh, trying to communicate uh, to our colleagues. So these are the key elements. I hope you are familiar with them. Um, uh, it helps you in the journey of, of creation, uh, 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 data storytelling and data visualizations like dashboard in Tableau. So when I started, um, a little bit of backstory, I've been always um, a developer. I've been always uh, was working to somebody. And then two years ago, I became the manager. And then it was like, oh my God, this is well, how we were working together, how to manage a team of many data visualization designers uh, and BI analysts. It's a different kind of ball game, definitely. And I try to bring all the experiences that I had when I was a developer uh, and also being part of uh, high tech companies, how we can make it better. In my current, in my current role in the current uh, company, when I joined, it was we had to build from zero. So we are still not uh, zero to uh, nada to Prada yet. We are in the middle. Uh, it's uh, but I'm going to show you now what kind of framework, what kind of um, changes I brought to the organization in order to uh, develop and deliver better data visualizations um, for the business. So I, I was lo looking for, and I was uh, picking parts from design ops and also from product development and software development um, from, from the ID side. Um, so design ops is the glue that connects how we work is done and what matters when it comes to creative consistency and user experience. So this design ops mindset is, uh, is um, focusing on a half of the practice, the people and the project. So the three pillars that I have are progress, process and people. And obviously the most uh, difficult to manage are the people. <laughs> uh how we can work together efficiently collaboration and community mindset and and especially communication which is usually we are lack of communication um so it it might be good uh helpful for you guys 
uh, if you're in a transition uh, in into a new role or or you are changing the decentralized to centralized uh, data data teams um these these are the ones that i have been um in the last two years managed to create uh a new ways of working so um we have in the region we have over 120 dashboards and both now we managed to run on two platforms either tableau or either power bi so not just we had to create standardized dashboard templates uh, across the countries but also across the the, the platforms as well um, so we created a harmonized color palette for the better user experience so when they are looking at the dashboards they know um it's uh, it's ours and it's official and we used a, a different color palette for the official dashboards and the dashboards that was more self-service analytics based so we can uh, one that different dashboard color for uh totally absolutely curated data set and curated data model and this, uh, the other uh, color for other color palette for the data analyst they, they were just uh, using self-service analytics. Uh, it's also very important. You guys have no clue when we were struggling with the naming conventions uh, because we had, it turned out that we have uh, different uh, dashboards, different names, but actually they were showing the same thing uh we standardized the project firm framework as well um and we started to treat dashboards as data products as in software development so we introduced the agile development tools uh, uh creating kanban boards who is doing what which part of the development where we where we are at what what additional features uh we want to add to the dashboard we also started um uh, documentation in, in Colibra, all the KPIs and what are the calculations behind. Because I know we are, we are data people, we are kind of allergic to documentation. So I wanted to make sure that, uh, that all the KPIs and all the calculations are documented in some place, some universal place, then we can go back and look. Um, which I know in these 10 years of experience, it's been, it's been a struggle. Because one one designer leaves, the other comes, and there is no documentation, and I, we don't know what's behind the dashboard. Uh, I also uh, what I create, uh, what I establish to have weekly stand up meetings uh, with the countries. I have eight countries, and and four of them are uh, working working uh, weekly on dashboards and reporting. So alignment again, align and communication. And it's also a data community. Uh, this week I create, I did a, a Tableau day at my work for human farm and animal health uh, to show the benefits of, of Tableau and data analytics and, and how to create visually pleasing that business dashboards. And with this data community, I'm trying to advocate using uh, data, visual, data visualization in the company. And it was really nice because you don't know what comes to you. Uh, legal and compliance, they were totally blown away by the uh, by the by the Tableau community and 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 all the the business dashboards that the Tableau communities uh, published in in uh, in Tableau Public. Uh, and they were like, "Oh my God, we also we want it." And who who knew that uh, compliance and legal wants to create uh, Tableau dashboards? uh also we have lunch and learn and lunch data doctor sessions i also copied it from the the tableau blueprint and what is being the most difficult part of my job is upscaling um uh, leadership and upscaling my colleagues uh, we are going through major implementation uh with snowflake and um one example that i can give you is one of my country can code in python and sql uh the other country only knew excel before so it's, it's also been really difficult and a big big project 
to give trainings and workshops then have everybody on the same level this is this is about the new framework and this is about a new way of working uh, in the last two years i hope i could give you some tips and uh what to establish in your team this has been working for us uh, pretty neatly now we are going to the visuals um what kind of ux and ui tools you can use in the team and and for yourself as well uh so what are the design ux design tools um so i was really digging into further i'm really really interested in ux and ui design and also especially the psychological mindset and uh, there are so many psychological researches behind ux and U, uh, U, uh, ux and ui um so uh, it's really nice to use it uh uh that the best practices of user experience design helps you to create brilliant data products, dashboards that truly captivate, engage, and delight your customers. So there is so many, there's loads, there's over a hundred of uh, UX UI principles that you can use and you can brush through and, and uh, look through them, what is working uh, most for you. Uh, like the Doher Doherty threshold, the Doherty threshold, which is saying that after for 10 seconds you lose interest so when your dashboard is not loading more uh, loading further than 10 seconds that's bad then we will lose interest then we're going to go out to the kitchen and have a cup cup of coffee and we we lose uh wh why we, what we were looking at or also the occam's Resor principle is um is is uh, is basically what apple applied in the last 20 years of having the simplest design concept as possible. So there's so many, and, all, and there is like, uh, what I also, uh, I'm very conscious when we are creating dashboards, that according to uh, uh, research, um, your brain can capture seven objects at one time. So I always try to be around seven uh, in a dashboard, seven charts, uh, seven parts, uh, or or seven KPIs, big KPIs, uh, because after seven objects, our brain goes to cognitive overload. And there's so, so, so many uh, uh, principles, UX, UI principles that, that you can apply. So there's three types of UX tools, um, which are for research and design and testing. Uh, we are going to talk about the UX design part, which is very useful for Tableau dashboards, which is uh, wireframing prototyping. So you can, with UX UI tools, you can create a flow chart. So um, when it's a very complicated uh, dashboard, then you can, uh, with UX UI tool, you can create a flow chart and map your users uh flow where your user would like to go and make it as easier for you and and uh, navigation for for that purpose purpose we um the top notch uh business dashboards they always have a navigation panel on the left why it's also it's also ux uh, ui principle uh, Nielsen, a psycholo psychological researcher, 20, 30 years ago, was able to uh, uh, create uh, uh, his research and his uh, uh, paper on where our eyesight is gazing when we are looking at the dashboard. And our eyesight uh, is gazing into uh, looking at the F, like an F uh, letter. So that's why it's very important for your navigation panel to be on the left side, because this is where your your eye is looking at the first time. If you are a Hebrew Hebrew or Arabic speaker, uh, then it is the the opposite side. And wireframing and prototyping, uh, wireframing is generating uh, low or high fidelity visualizations. Prototyping is create a more sophisticated visualizations of design solutions that it's gonna look, it's gonna show you how more or less the, the final product will, will look like and, it, and you can try it out 
uh, with interviews with your business stakeholders. Okay, what, what kind of design you like better? What is going to work more better for you? And why this collaboration is so important? Because at the end of the day, we are we are designers. Uh, we don't most of the time we don't create these dashboards for ourselves. So it's really important to collabor collaborate and ask questions uh, with your stakeholders. Is it going to work for you? Are you colorblind? Of course, not like directly asking, are you colorblind? But, uh, you know, are you capturing these colors? Um, do you see, is it easy to navig navigate? I'm, I'm bringing you an example, which we failed. I failed really badly one time. Um, we created a, a, a kind of complex dashboard for only uh, sales representatives uh, for the company. And we assumed on the iPad, they will able to navigate that because Tableau has a really good app for, for, for iPad and phone. That's fine. But uh, we didn't have enough collaborative time or space that to to interview them that actually they they don't have a apple pen to select and and uh, they with the finger it was basically impossible to filter the dashboard and uh so it's and also in a i in a ipad we didn't test it with uh with the pro with the correct wireframe and prototype that it was just overloaded it looks totally different in iPad than in, in, in a MacBook, for example. So we had to go back and change everything. So it's really important. We learned, I learned my lesson. Everybody learned the lesson to prototype and wireframe and test it out and collaborate. Uh, or favorite tool I think so far is Figma. So your best UX UI tool uh to do the fire viral framing and to to be very creative on tableau is figma so far so good is still free uh so it's a ux design platform that lets you build interactive prototypes with a user-friendly ui and it's it's not a steep learning curve and there's so many in, even on youtube on many educational platforms you can learn how to use figma uh and basically you know, go to a UX UI designer level as well. And they have very nice charts and uh, infographic kits uh, that uh, you can use and you can build uh, also like crazy, like iron V stuff as well. And this is, I'm bringing one of my examples that I, I did for for the Spotify dashboard. Uh, this is you see my 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 wireframe how I was building from uh, from only um, wireframe where where I want to put my charts where I want to my, put my KPI and then I was like more on the prototype side okay this is the color this is how it's going to look like um, uh, do I like this color combination of course with Spotify you didn't have so many uh, options but I was like okay and then I was like okay one well, I want to make it fluffy I want to make it round. So this was um, this was the end. So you can play with if it's only for your own. You can also play it with uh, in your free time. It's very useful. Uh, the other one I really want to mention. I wouldn't be a good friend if I wouldn't mention Tristan. Um, Tristan is a Tableau visionary for multiple years, and he's creating really cool stuff for the community. Uh, one of them is uh, Figma to Tableau. It's paid, but you can, you know, uh, you can go to Figma and um, and um, you know you can support Tristan. He, it's really cool. Uh, it's an amazing tool. So it's actually ex exporting your Figma design into a fully functional Tableau dashboard. It's it's an excellent tool. As I see your I see in the comments as well. Um, the other alternative is Sketch. Uh, it's only for Mac uh, Mac platform. Uh, it's it's also all in one, everything built in. If you are really stick to the Mac, uh, then you can use it. If you're not really obsessed with Mac, then you can just just use Figma. They do the same thing. 
so we, we there is so you know it's a uh, my newest buzzword of the year of last year is ai and when people are mentioning ai i feel like i'm gonna just uh, run out of the room and cry and shout and like throw my laptop on them uh, because AI is not, <laughs> it's not a uh, password, it's not the secret source for everything, but however, we can use a few of their tools and I use, uh, uh, and also with Tableau Pools, it's another session, you can uh, enhance the analytics, uh, but here, in uh, in this presentation that I do for you, it's we can use a few AI tools that can enhance your work, uh, and not Chat GPT. We are not, you know, we, we are talking about Gen AI uh, at this point. Uh, so, yes, so I made a mistake because Procreate and Adobe Fresco they are not AI tools. My AI, AI tool is going to be the next slide. Sorry, guys. So. Uh, if you are really into digital art and you are kind of artsy, you can play around with Procreate and Adobe Fresco. I'm a huge fan of Procreate. It's a, they are digital illustration apps. Uh, I was an um, art school student for many years. And this is my new way. This is my new canvas, basically. I, uh, and with my iPad, I can, I can create whatever I want. Uh, so it's the best digital illustration, sketching, and also uh, when I don't have so much time, I in Procreate or or any other, I just sketch, I just sketch the wireframe of the dashboard in Procreate, for example. So you can use that for uh, for that as well, and it's also available on your iPad and iPhone. Again, it's a Mac tool, so it's also uh, iPad or iPhone. Adobe Fresco is running on Windows as well. Uh, it's also you can have it for free for a certain time, like a trial version, but then you have to pay for it. It also do, uh, uh, does the same job for you. It's also drawing and painting with the brushes, and you can also go, do, go so, to do some crazy digital art stuff. And this is what, uh, bringing you an example, one of my Star Wars dashboards. I'm a nerd, I love Star Wars, so I um, it's out in the public, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, so with this, I did the background with brushes in Procreate. I also did the, the uh, 3TPO and R2D2 also in Procreate and also modified the, the Millennial Falcon in Procreate. And this is how I put everything together for this for this dashboard. And also my favorite Coxcomb chart is, is there and also created the if you if you go to my dashboards and there is a click on on the palette inspiration it's 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 tatuan is the the planet tatuan in the star wars universe and i also created that as as a as a palette uh so you can go crazy when i had time you know during covid but nowadays it's it's very very occasion that i can do these things okay so back to the ai um I'm totally fan of Mid Journey, but probably for my only private use because I have a feeling I'm I'm breaking some law uh, there. Um, so Mid Journey is an amazing uh, Gen AI um, uh, image generator. It's also paid, but what the quality and what what it can give you is is crazy. Uh, it works as a, as exactly as a chat GPT. You have to use a prompt and you have to uh, write uh, to Mid Journey what do you want to see. And you you it's it's hard to get the language, but after after a while you can you can get it right. And and if I knew that before I created the Star Wars dashboard because it can give you all of the Star Wars craziness that I wanted before so mid journey is a really good uh, uh if you want to go crazy on on the AI, ai image generators for your dashboards as well the corporate friendly tool is adobe firefly um it's you're not breaking any copyrights with it uh, because all of the content are, are coming from adobe stock However, I don't think it's the same quality as Mid Journey because it's limited uh, um, from the Adobe stock. But this, 
Yeah, this is this is I think is the next next uh, this is the future. How we can discuss how is uh, are we breaking some copyrights and uh, uh, laws with using AI or not? <laughs> The other AI fluff, which I find very extremely useful and helpful for me and for, for my team is Grammarly because Tableau doesn't have a spelling check. So uh, after you, you download Grammarly, uh, it will be able to you know, help you. And if you are, because I am not an English native speaker. So it's, it's been a really great tool. Uh, 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 to you know help me through because you can't like after you're doing your fifth or third or whatever how many dashboards you just you know you make mistakes and that's fine everybody's making mistakes but it has been like it's been like really pain, pain uh highlighting my mistakes and and it's helped me to it's help us to get a very better quality uh without typos <laughs> uh the other one is um is uh, R I T R. I'm very scared to pronounce it. Uh, it's it's an AI writer and content generator and writing assistant for you. It's been helping us with the documentation and and uh, and also with instructions for all business users and stakeholders how to use the dashboard. It's it's a brilliant gener content generator. Um, it actually can pick you uh, how you write things. So it's also paid, unfortunately, but um, it, it, I think this is one of the best in the market currently. Oh, writer. OK, I got it. OK, thank you. <laughs> I saw in the comment. Um, charts. OK, the next time is charts. Everybody's godfather. So data visualizations godfather is uh, Andy Cribble. I think everybody knows him. You can use his cheat sheet on Tableau Public. Uh, he has this brilliant visual vocabulary. And when you in doubt what kind of chart to use, please, you, uh, you're free to use it. And for it, it helped me to upscale my data analysts, uh, to be honest, uh, because when they had a, a um, you know, doubts, okay, how to do this? What do you think? What is the best chart for it? Because especially for business dashboards, you cannot go crazy. You have to make sure that your audience understands your charts. And and I I would love to put Coxcomb chart everywhere, but uh, or rudder chart everywhere, but it's uh, they cannot process it, uh, especially in sea level. So it, it helps you um, very much a lot uh, if you're in depth of, OK, wh what kind of chart uh, to use. And of course, another one, Tristan, <laughs> uh, his, uh, his charts. Uh, you can go to uh, ladataviz.com. And, and he's also helping you. He's created a, a brilliant uh, uh, tools for you to create these uh, which, which you know, it was, it's, it's uh, very helpful. You don't have to mathematically create and code these uh, charts anymore. You can use uh, Tristan's uh, templates. That's why the community is amazing. You know, we have these people helping to to the community. Uh, and also, um, since you know, Tableau is part of Salesforce. Salesforce always had Trailhead, and uh, please use. They are the Trailhead people. They are using uh, putting out a lot of content about Tableau, and I created my own uh, Zero to Hero. It's around five six hours of of uh, Tableau learning. Please use it. Uh, uh, you can you can copy the link um, and. It's gonna build your skills up from from zero to to hero, and also it's a trailhead currently. Um, they're really engaged to to place free training, and um, and also preparing you for the certificates. 
um, and it's you can also like Einstein analytics, uh, AI. They have they have uh, marketing material and content. They have a lot of stuff and for free, guys. When we get things for free in the last uh, two years, right? So please go there and and use it. And I think I'm done with the forty minutes. And thank you. This is I think this this um, this code brings me to my LinkedIn page. If you would, would like to add me and communicate, and I'm always up to uh, help you and, and respond as much as I can. And thank you for having me and have a lovely Easter break. Thank you very much, Timea. Uh, I think my sound is better now, right? Yes. <laughs> I am back to the Wi-Fi. Um, please feel free to ask some uh, question to Timea in the Q&A. Uh, I have seen that in LinkedIn you have a question uh, how, uh, from Adrian Zinove. Uh, how easy was the Snowflake implementation transition? How is <laughs> the longer question, answer? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. Maybe it's a long answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, so especially it's coming from Adrian. <laughs> exactly, because um, how easy was the Snowflake implementation? I think it's a, it's not a, a, a an answer that you can give like. Uh, no, because it takes years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Please reach out directly to Adrian. As you know, <laughs> you will uh, you will check, um, and I will ask. Um, a very most probably of a question I will let uh, Prasam and Shimdi uh, ask uh, them to you. But uh, please, Timea, uh, send me like uh, all the resources and I will make sure to uh, to send it by email to the participant. Okay. So we have we do have a question. Here, so uh, Sarah is asking that: Do leaders at your company leverage both Tableau and Power BI visuals? If so, is that a reason why you found a design template that works across both? Can you hear me? No. I do, and I saw so. Also, I'm I'm looking at the question. It's from Sarah, right? Yes. Uh, both tableau, uh, so. um, yes, it's a really good question um, because I'm crazy for a, a, a user experience. So I wanted to give the same user experience in, in Tableau and Power BI as well. Uh, same colors. Uh, you cannot leverage 100% because we know Tableau is much better. Sorry. Uh, not sorry, uh, uh, but I also I wanted to challenge the people who are working with Power BI uh, to also go to that level of Tableau, go to that chart, go to that uh, 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 visuals, and so it it had double meaning as well. I wanted to challenge them, and also I wanted to give the same user experience. And and there is there is um, which. It's it's not the same template because also for example, uh, you can create your own template for Tableau, but for for Power BI, it's a JSON file, so you cannot leverage the two platforms like that. But it was the same same colors. If it if if it makes sense, I think that answer helps a lot, Timia. Uh, yes. Yeah, we have one more question. Can you share any documentation samples? How often do you find yourself updating it? Uh, Viraj, what kind of documentation samples do you mean? Because I work with a ton of documentations. So Viraj, there's a counter question. So is it about Tableau dashboard documentation or the whole process DIY? or framework? Yes. Or yeah, or what what we always update uh, constantly is if we are doing some changes in the dashboard so the user uh, the user instructions we keep updating 
And then we are changing the KPIs. It, it's an, it's if we add to the document more and more, and also very helpful to use a Kanban board. I think and that elaborates on his on question, Timia. Uh, to trailhead zero to hero. Uh, I think we'll send it over to you over the email after this event is over. So everybody will be having it. So not a problem there. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Timia, for your time and uh, for sharing this uh, knowledge about user experience, also leveraging, leveraging all these tools. Uh, I think uh, that's quite a lot of help who are trying to dig into the design side as well into the user experience side not just building dashboard because now i think it's really really important if if you have to incorporate all these things thank you so much thanks for having me spreading the love of data yep Okay. So time for the next speaker. Do you want to uh, pass on to uh, share your screen and present the next speaker? Present Agatha. Okay. Don't try yeah. to spoil my screen. I, I like giving order <laughs> somehow. I'm too bossy. <laughs> Just a minute. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Cool. So uh, now we have uh, Agatha Basinka, also known as Roska Tableau or the Tableau Fairy, which uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And she is a Tableau consultant and trainer at New Data Labs. She formerly worked as a female magazine's journalist, a European funding specialist, and a foreign direct investment analyst. I think these are this is quite a journey. So we'd love to hear from Agatha herself. And Agatha is fascinated with color theory, storytelling, and ways to share knowledge. She's addicted to learning and reading and also collects Tableau certificates. And outside of work, Agatha is in love with playing guitar. And last but definitely not the least, she's a happy wife and mother of two. And today she is going to talk about business dashboards and how storytelling can work together. Thank you so much, Agatha. Thank you so much for being here and also bringing this uh, very valuable topic. So over to you. Thank you, Prasam. And thank you for letting me speak today. Just a moment to show my screen. Uh, okay. So just to finish with the introduction, I come from Poland. I'm from Warsaw, Poland, Warsaw. I've seen here somebody from Warsaw in Indiana. So hello from the other Warsaw. Uh, and uh, well, don't even try to pronounce my surname. It's Melzyńska, which is tongue breaker. No one outside Poland is able to pronounce it. So I'm Agata. That's enough. And the Tableau Fairy in Polish is Wróżka Tablo, which is another tongue breaker. So Tableau Fairy, Tableau, which, whichever you want is fine. Actually, the 
thing is that if my children see the the the, the picture here with Tableau, which they know that it's me, so it works. Okay, so I will be talking about business dashboards and storytelling and how to make them work together. Well, the whole thing began more or less, uh, I think, four years ago or five years ago when I tried to uh, take uh, exam and become a Tableau certified professional. Uh, one moment, I need to make it work. Okay. And uh, the buzzword for the exam used to be storytelling. And it was somehow strange. You know, we were told, okay, do stories with your data. Tell everybody about your data. Uh, show what's important in it. Use story in Tableau. And when I came back to my work, I talked to my colleagues who are also Tableau consultant. I heard you're using story. And do you know, Agatha, that you are the only one? Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, so it felt a little bit strange. I'm on purpose using now story in Tableau to present you what I'm talking about. But OK, that was the challenge, too. Uh, so there's something uneasy about connecting these two things, storytelling and business dashboards. Um, well, we've seen number of uh, absolutely uh, amazing dashboards uh, in Tableau Public uh, with storytelling. Okay, that one is not the best, it's mine. So there are way better uh, others around, but still, as an example. Uh, when I tried to learn to the exam, okay, I passed it, but I was really surprised that I passed. Uh, when I was preparing for the exam, there was a number of white papers to read with lots of great suggestions what to do and uh, well one of my favorite suggestions was that if you want to have your story in the dashboard told really well what you can do is to have all your tool tips written with full sentences like here okay lovely great it looks wonderful if you speak english but then i'm perfectly sure that somebody who has created uh, a tip has never even tried to spoke any Slavic language. You know, when you want to tell your in Polish, you have 31 different options. And now try to put it into calculated field in Tableau. It's a nightmare. If anybody manages, my congratulations. I do not even try. And pretty big part of the dashboards I do are in Polish because that's the mother tongue of most of my clients. Okay, so we know all these wonderful ideas about storytelling, dashboards, about the dashboards should tell story. In Iron Fist, people are really expected to show great storytelling skills. And then in the end of the day, that's what we have. A couple of business dashboards, nicely looking. Uh, they can be beautifully designed. They are prepared to show people what they need in a given moment. Uh, they should answer the questions which are needed to take the basic decisions. Dashboard, after all, is a decision-making uh, tool. But where's the storytelling? You know, when you think about this, the story, there is something nice some vibe about it. Story arouses some feelings and it's tempting. I would still feel like it would be nice to tell some stories in this business dashboard. So let's think what is possible here. Uh, well, so first I would like to talk a little bit about stories before I go to the dashboards. And I told you that stories are tempting. Yes, there is a wonderful Indian proverb which says that, which says, tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. But 
tell me a story and I leave it in my heart forever. Oh, that's tempting. And why? Why is it so tempting? Well, the interesting is what uh, stories do with our brains, what they do with us. So the thing is that when somebody starts telling a story, uh, in his brain, what is engaged not are not just the parts that are responsible for talking or uh, creating some speech, but also the parts responsible for, sen uh, for senses. When we imagine something, we kind of feel it, we kind of smell it, we kind of hear it, we kind of see it in front of our eyes. So when somebody is telling stories, uh, the senses are engaged. What else? Also, hormones are released, and these include uh, uh, cortisol, the hormone of stress, and also uh, oxytocin, which is hormone of love, home, home, hormone of bonding. So these are released in the brain of storytellers. So what happens to the ones who are audience? The funny part is that the brains of storyteller and brains of to brain of storyteller and brains of the audience get somehow synchronized and similar things start to happen on both sides and that's amazing because that allows us when the story is told to feel to sense to connect with one another and in the end also it allows to awaken us to start to act great thing okay so the story starts to be even more tempting at that moment and the numbers in dashboards well if somebody told you that the numbers can speak from, for themselves mm -mm. the person must have been lying no way. Uh, probably the best evidence of that is a story of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. If you have never heard of him, that's the person who introduced for the first time hand washing. Uh, there's pretty horrifying story behind that. So he worked in one of the hospitals in Vienna in 1840s, more or less. And in the hospital, there were two uh, clinics uh, where uh, women came to uh, for childbirth. And in one of the clinics, the childbirths were assisted by midwives and in the other by the doctors. And surprisingly, in the latter one, the one where doctors assisted, the uh, mortality from childbirth fever was way, way higher. And no one could understand what is really happening. And absolutely accidentally, uh, it happened that uh, Dr. Uh, Semmelweis, Semmelweis uh, was performing a necroscopy, uh, was, uh, mm, was examining the dead body of his friend who died after performing a necroscopy and being cut by a surgical knife used for that. And the, the man died. And what Dr. Zemmelweis uh, has found is that the changes in his tissues, changes in his body were very similar to the ones that he saw earlier with these women who died from childbed fever. So he realized that probably if in the morning doctors assist or uh, take part in uh, examining dead bodies and then without washing hands or doing anything, just go directly to uh, assisting uh, deliveries, it might cause the problem. So he uh, started convincing others to hand washing policy. They have introduced that in mid-May of uh, 1847, and it was huge success. In just a month, uh, they managed to decrease uh, the number 
of uh, their share of uh, their level of mortality by 10%. That's that's a great thing, and they managed to keep good numbers for a couple of a uh, couple of uh, months, uh, and then. Uh, even improved it after being more strict to students uh, in case, uh, for uh, for medis, um, medical students who didn't wash their hands and everything was great till people started to forgot to think uh, about washing their hands we all remember well covid times in the beginning we were very strict to ourselves about wearing masks Later, it didn't work that well. So similar thing happened here. And finally, when uh, the mortality rose again, uh, Dr. Uh, Zamel Weiss was dismissed. Why? We have, the, we have here the graphs that show everything just, just perfectly. So why didn't these numbers speak to, to people? Well, the answer is that they were presented, sorry, they were presented like, like that. So people just saw pure numbers, just tables, nothing more. Pretty boring. If you can get convinced to anything with such a data, think about looking at that on Friday evening, 5 p.m it will be probably slightly more difficult. If he told us, if instead of showing the numbers that should talk for themselves, uh, if instead of that, he would tell to his colleagues story about a real woman, Heidi, Inge, whatever, uh, mother of three or even four, who came to them and died, left her children, that would be probably more successful. The story would convince probably way better. And why story is so much needed for any business? Well, even though we have dashboards. Well, uh, because story brings it emotions. And I'm a huge fan of, of Star Trek, especially Star Trek Next Generation. And if you analyze what was happening there, the normal thing would be uh, for Captain Jean-Luc uh, Jean Picard to take a decision, but he wouldn't do that by himself. First, he, was, who, he would listen to some of his crew, uh, especially Commander Data, uh, android robot uh, who was who very much wanted to be human like but still was really really logic and he would imply logic to the decisions but on the other side there was also chancellor uh, chancellor the uh, Amala Troy who would bring in emotions only if you have both sides emotions and logic, you can take really good decisions. And probably you hear one problem here. I mentioned before that dashboard is a decision-making tool. Where are emotions in dashboard, especially business dashboards? Hard to find. So what's the problem? And uh, yeah, what's the problem? Okay, the problem is in the type of, uh, in the type of, uh, the problem is in the type of insight you want to use for your decision making. So when you have some insight that is just normal, uh, conventional, easy, safe, intuitive, no problem. Uh, you, can, you can take decision just looking at the dashboard. If these uh, become unpleasant, disruptive, complex, risky, costly, the problems start. The problem starts to be much bigger. If the potential value of the decision is high, also you need something more than just a dashboard, and that's the story. So, if the dashboard is for easy decisions, why is it so? Well, uh, usually dashboards uh, are kind of informative. They are uh, loaded systematically. They 
load they are loaded in a continuous manner uh, they are exploratory we want to learn something uh, we want to um, we want to uh, see how data is uh, changing on and then the story has to be done for one time. It has to explain everything. Uh, it has to be very concrete, finite, and curated. So if you have some complicated decision to be taken, you need a story. If you want to look at data for everyday decisions, that's the dashboard stuff. So are the dashboards, complete, dashboards completely useless for storytelling? Not necessarily. First, they provide some images, which would be useful. And uh, the other thing is that our brain can fill many gaps and elaborate on many topics. Uh, so we can, uh, we can really easily go farther. I've got one question. Uh, as everything stopped, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, you can. Good. Because right, I, can... I, mean, I stop you at one moment. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so, what can we do with a dashboard to uh, to use it uh, to tell a story? Yeah. What can we do? It depends on our aim. There are two ways. We can just present the data we have on the dashboard. So the only thing we need to do that is to teach our numbers talk. And the other thing is to convince. If we want to convince, then we have to shape the whole story and dig in our data for some more elements. Okay. For, as for the first thing, how to teach numbers to talk, I usually would be able to talk for another hour. So I will have just one example and then go to building the story, which will help you with convincing people coming from dashboard. Okay, so just one example. Well, if you want your number to tell a story, if you want your numbers to be easily understood, you have to remember that people like things simple. In general, if you take percentages, percentages are, well, you know that it's a lot or not a lot, but you do not really feel how much of that a lot it is. Uh, here I've got an example uh, of 92%, which stands for 92% of women killed with guns in high income countries. And this 92% of them on average every year come from United States. Very, very sad statistic. But if you look at the number, it's like, okay, it's sad, but so what? But if you illustrate that with, with any graph, any chart, whatever, it completely changes the situation. I haven't felt the number till I have drawn the picture uh, on, its, uh, on the right side. It changes really, really a lot. Okay. Uh, so if you are to look for something that will help you uh, tell a story from the dashboard, where can you look? Well. I thought there is some good recipe that you can use and yeah, and see everything just right away. But it's not that easy. You can look, of course, through trends in time and space, distributions, outliers, comparisons, rankings, missing data, correlations. Yeah, these are places where you can look for something that potentially will give you a uh, good story. But actually, absolutely the best method is a chart vomit. A chart vomit meaning uh, sitting down and starting drawing charts. Tableau is great for that, happily. Um, and once you start drawing, it's good to ask yourself questions. What else can I see? What else could I find? Where else could I go? And with that, go to the story. Before I go to the example, which I have, of course, prepared, um, I would like to show you how to shape the story, more or less, what are the rules for that? And 
Well, if you would go with that, probably you would start with setting a scene. So if uh, that we about business dashboard probably i would say uh, and business data i probably would say well in our company we've got such a problem which is connected to and now i'm introducing the character what is the character the character is of course a number let's say two million and two million loss okay so we've got two million loss our challenge is that with that loss, we cannot develop as well as we would like to. We cannot go into the new markets because we do not have enough funds for that. Okay, so how can we overcome our challenge? Well, we can revise our discounting policy and that will allow us to do what we need. And, and now I should tell what my audience should do further and what should they do with the knowledge that I have provided them uh, with. Okay, I can present that also in slightly uh, different way. Uh, if I show you something called um, something called a story arc, you will see that we've got beginning, middle and end of our story. And what differs, what differentiates them is the tension. The tension grows and uh, we get more and more information. We get to the climax and then there is time for resolution. So what does it mean introduction? Uh, middle and end, uh, and end in the case of business story. In introduction, usually I would talk about, well, introducing my plot, of course, providing some context and explaining why people should listen to what I have to say to them. Then we go into what if. I am explaining the problem, but also giving as many examples as I can, meaningful examples, these that will be valuable for my audience. And I say, what will happen? What would happen if we do nothing? What will happen if we do this, this and that? And finally, in the end, I get to explaining people what they should do with the knowledge they gain. and try to bring them uh, some call for action. So if I took a uh, sample superstore data and tried to give you the example of what could have been done, I would probably go to a dashboard. Well, I've got dashboard prepared here, but unfortunately in story, it does not work as well as I would like it to. Well, you can sort it in a way. Uh, yeah, I'm going to dash, yeah, I can sort my data I've got here sales profit and discount uh, by product subcategory plus possibility look at that uh, via regions segments and ship notes I can decide if I want to look at current year last year or shops a lifetime we all know sample superstore data and let's say that I want to check how do profits by subcategory look? I want to figure out which subcategories are least profitable, which bring in loss. Okay, I'm sorting that descending and I can see that I've got loss with tables, of course, why Tableau is so bad with tables, checking sample superstore, uh, then machines, supplies, and also with bookcases. The question is if it has anything to do with discounts. Well, this average discounts in case of tables and machines are pretty high. Then for supplies, not that much. Bookcases, well, pretty big, but the biggest average, uh, biggest average discount we've got for binders subcategory. Okay. What does it mean? Well, to be able to tell anything and to go further with the story, I have to have some more, some more charts. That's definitely not enough to look into that deeper. Uh, I can have a hint. Well, 
this 38% of average discount looks like an outlier. I want to look at profits and discounts, but that's definitely not enough. So I go back to my story and I've got a couple of extra charts that I have drawn. First one was to check if there are changes, if there are any changes in time. So I have drawn uh, sales, that's the size of the ball, uh, for each subcategory in each month, coloring it with, uh, coloring it with uh, profit, very basic thing. And I can see that in a couple of subcategories it's more orange than it should be especially in tables but it does not really reveal what is happening and why so i'm asking why and trying one trying to go one chart deeper what i see when i go one chart deeper well i have split profits and losses split them and try to look at them separately and now i see that the biggest losses are actually in binders subcategory tables following and then machines but what happens in binders subcategory the one that had exceptionally big discount uh discount average discount uh is that they also have huge incomes so the situation is somehow hidden Okay, uh, what's the scale of the problem? Well, when I go slightly deeper, I can see that uh, when I take just these three subcategories that seem to be problematic, just binders, machines, and tables, uh, these three categories account for two out of every dollars in losses. Okay. That starts to be interesting. And also, if instead of these losses, we would have profit, it would mean uh, that our potential profit would be one fourth bigger. So these three categories just by themselves are responsible for one fourth of lost potential profits. Uh, so what? Well, it means that probably it's high time to revise sample superstore discounting policy. And that shows us how we can build a story coming from some hint from the, from the dashboard. But the dashboard would never be enough. And that's the end of my story. So uh, thank you a lot. I hope I'm fine with time. And uh, are there any questions? I don't see any question, Agatha. Uh, we were like discussing on the chat, and I, I don't know if you have the, the answer. It was like a, an honest uh, discussion. Is it like more impactful for people? And we know that mathematically is the same. Say nine out of 10 or 90%. What will be more impactful? Do you have a, an opinion? I would, I would say uh, with 90, I would say nine out of 10 would be probably more impactful. Though here it's very close because nine is already a big digit. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, probably, probably nine out of 10. Uh, generally, it's easier to talk about easy numbers. So if you have no decimal places, if you say like more two out of three uh, than 66%, uh, than, uh, uh, if you say two million it, instead of uh, 199, yeah. <laughs> instead of going into more uh, specific numbers that's that's more impactful just in general i mean if we don't have another question thank you very much agatha that was a fantastic presentation everyone agree with me <laughs> for once <laughs> and i will let Chim D or like prasam uh, introduce the next speaker or conclude or give their own uh, opinion no, it was great, Thank great you. talk, Victor. Um, and and I do I do agree that you know in terms of building you know like dashboards and we have to think about the audience and the purpose. Like storytelling 
is definitely something that's entirely different from you know reporting so uh we'll move on to the next or last but not least speaker today i'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and do a quick introduction looks like i can't share my screen so annabelle do you mind uh or i Agata, do you mind stopping sharing, please? Awesome, there we go. All right, so now let's welcome our third speaker for today, Daniel Ballinson. So Daniel is currently a senior manager at Baker Tilly in US, and he's definitely someone who's worked with Tableau for a while, since 2015. And he's done a lot of stuff, mainly in manufacturing and distribution for companies with the supply chain. Um, Daniel is also a Tableau Data Dev Ambassador. And it looks like essentially for the past few years, he's been really putting a lot of his focus on Tableau extensions and APIs, going around and speaking about them to anyone who will listen. So I guess he has found us. We are a willing audience. And so he's going to be giving us a lot of pointers and tips on how we can do more on our dashboards with extensions and of course with code python et cetera, et cetera. so i'm going to stop sharing and i'm going to pass it over to you daniel all right thank you very much uh yeah really appreciate everyone uh carving out some time for me today i know i know there's lots going on and, and so i really do appreciate it um yeah i'm here to talk about extensions uh and um to convince you all that extensions are for you um by way of background, my name is Dan Bolenson. Um, as I, as, as a Jim D said, I've been working with extensions uh, or working with Tableau since 2015. Uh, and we really did get involved with Tableau through the supply chain space and using a lot of the mapping functionalities that Tableau makes super easy. So I'll show some examples of that later. But um, beyond that, I work, uh, or I live in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, so for those of you not US based, that's about two and a half hours outside of Chicago. Um, in the Midwest, where it's actually pretty beautiful today, which is nice. Uh, we're coming out of winter. Uh, I live with uh, my wife, my two daughters, and my two cats. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a lot of fun and keeps me super busy. Uh, I am getting over a, a pretty nasty cold, so I'm going to do my best today. I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, but first off, it looks like my screen share is coming through. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and dive in. Um, so I've gotten through my introduction. As I said, I want to convince you all today that you can build extensions. Uh, I don't know if, if people in the chat could speak up if they know a little bit of Python or if they've done any Visual Basic, any type of scripting in the past. That'd be helpful just to get a little bit of a sense of where folks are coming at. But a lot of what uh, I'll share today is uh, using a tool that allows us to build extensions in just Python. Um, but first off, what are Tableau extensions? So Tableau extensions are a framework that uh, Tableau's released that really lets us do more with our dashboards. So what it does is it gives us a way to uh, connect with some of the backend hooks. And uh, that means that we can do things when things get selected. It just really opens up a lot of doors in terms of the, the way that we can create interactivity in our dashboard. Awesome. I see a bunch of Python, a little bit of JavaScript, some VB. It's really great. Um, I promise today we won't get too deep into the code. There will be some code. It's no scarier than some of the some functions that I'm sure everyone has written in Tableau. Um, and so, so brace yourselves. But uh, what the way that we look at it is, you know, we all work really hard to build dashboards that are going to give people insight. And to, you know, I think we've talked a lot today about that storytelling to help people get to that aha moment that lets them make a better decision and lets them make takes better action in their organizations. So, from our perspective, what dashboards with extensions allow people to do is it lets them take that next step and lets them take action right from the dashboard. And so. That takes place by uh, giving different ways of interacting with dashboards and different ways of interacting with other tools that are connected to those dashboards. So a really, really classic example uh, is writeback, is the ability to uh, take create a form in the extension that then lets you, uh, Fortran, for, nice one, John, uh, that lets you write back to uh, source data in different ways. That might just be by making an update into a database, or it might be making an API call, uh, or it might be uh, you know, creating a parallel data set, which is what we'll talk through a little bit today. But ultimately, it's about uh, letting users do more and enrich some of that data right from their dashboard. 
And so really what that means is we can start to build business processes in our dashboards. So, you know, a really basic example that we have is a dashboard where uh, our one of our clients' customers are able to view the real-time inventory levels uh, that they are carrying of, of items that that customer has ordered. And so then they get a button in that dashboard that's actually letting them place an order to reserve some of that capacity. So it's that small little bit extra feature that then uh, lets that person take that next step without having to leave the dashboard. It's also a powerful framework for adding different types of interactivity. Uh, and so we'll share a little bit more about that too. Uh, in terms of how we got started with this, so I first heard about Tableau extensions at Tableau conference in 2019. Uh, and so, you know, we'd been working with Tableau for a while. Uh, and we were uh, really keen to start taking that next step with our clients and to do more. And so we heard about the extension framework, and that really did seem like the answer. That seemed like it had a lot of capability for us to uh, to extend what we're doing and, and help our customers take that, uh, to get additional value out of that investment they've made with Tableau and, and to really start to do more. So this sounded great. This is what I spent most of that conference trying to figure out, and it did not go well. Uh, I am not a web dev, uh, and that's what Tableau extensions are. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but they are web applications. And so traditionally, if you want to build a Tableau extension, you need to build a web application. You need to host a server. You need to um, write your HTTP to represent the data. You need to write your JavaScript to interact with the API. It's not my skill set. Uh, I'm a data analyst, data engineer by training, uh, and so the the prospect of spinning up a web application and and all everything that that took was was not something that um, that I could get through. Uh, and so we took it away. We spent some more time, and and we uh, had in had previously at the same time been working more with a tool called Anvil. Uh, and Anvil is a, a web application development framework uh, in just Python. And so it really is trying to bridge that gap for folks like me that that know some Python are not web devs, but but do want to you know leverage some of what that capability offers. And so for the first time using Anvil, we were able to get an extension off the ground. That was really really exciting. And so we started to sit down and try to figure out how to apply this in some customer in some customer use cases, and it did not go well. And the reason for that is the 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 web the extension framework is is rich. There's a lot going on there, uh, and for us it was um, I think it was a little overwhelming in its complexity. And so over time, what we did is we've wrapped that extension framework in a Python library uh, that then has really let us build those extensions really really quickly. And that's kind of what I'm here to share with you today um, to try to really cut through a lot of the complexity that would typically come from this. So what did we learn through this? Uh, first off, you know, Tableau extensions are super powerful. Uh, they, they really do let us do a lot more. Uh, and some of the use cases that I'm going to share with you today, I think we'll, we'll prove some of that. Uh, and you know, for folks that um, are able to adopt them in their organizations, it uncovers just a huge amount of different types of use cases uh, that just aren't, you know, that don't lend themselves to native Tableau, but really can be uh, really useful and generate a lot of value. Uh, with a little bit of uh, a little bit of Python, and you know, as I said before, a simple API is required. So the T-Rex jacket is a uh, API that um, it's an open source project that we that we manage, um, and that is basically um, a way to interact with the extension API mm -hmm. in more of a Pythonic way. So I'll, it, it's also got a bunch of um, different uh, like tutorials and resources that are out there to get started. Uh, so I'm going to just post this into the chat. But if this is of interest and you do want to give it a try, I really do recommend it. This is probably the place to start. Um, so some of the key use cases that we talk about are really about enriching data with additional insight. So, you know, that's working with our users to let them lend some of their qualitative experience and data into the dashboard for other users. It's all about embedding Tableau right in business processes. And I think I'm just going to actually cut over right now to a couple of different examples that we're prepared to share today. So this is a really basic extension, uh, but it's really one of the ones that kicked us off. So I like to share it. 
what this is, is it's a dashboard that many of us probably know and love. Uh, and that is the, uh, the sales or the superstore dashboard. I think we've seen it today, actually. Uh, and what this is, is it just lets us track profitability across, a, uh, across the US for this organization. And what we have over here is this extension. And what this is letting us do is to facilitate conversation between our users. So when I click on a state, it's gonna pull up all of the different comments that other users who are using this dashboard might have made. And I can make my own comment to like, New Mexico was behind targets. I'm gonna save that so that now anytime any other user comes in and clicks on this or, or navigates to New Mexico, they're gonna see that conversation that we're now having right within the dashboard. It's really, really simple, um, but I think it really does start to uh, get to this idea of letting our users inform the dashboard and actually feed information back into the dashboard so that other people who are coming in here start to get more context and start to get a bigger picture of what's actually going on. Uh, and this is a dashboard that kind of comes as a, you can you can dump this one right in as a, as a beginning dashboard. So it's sort of out of the box and ready for you to play with, which I'll come back to. This next dashboard is for a client we have that is, um, they sell medical devices. And in the US, uh, the sale of medical devices is super regulated. Uh, and there are really, really strict rules around what you are and are not allowed to do and who you, like even how many times you're communicating with doctors as a salesperson, all of this stuff uh, is, pretty, uh, is pretty regulated. And as part of that, they need to measure their sales organizations against that behavior. And so part of this, you know, they have all of their different sales people here and they're actually scoring them. Uh, these are points against those sales people for suspected violations. And so if we click on one of these, we see the full history of the interactions that the team has had with that individual. And so we see that in a couple of these, these transactions have actually been cleared and we had an interview with this person to uh, start to see what's going on and to understand why, you know, what, what is this pattern of behavior that we're seeing? Um, and in this next dashboard, what this is, is it drills us down into those transactions that are specifically occurring uh, and, lets the, uh, and lets the administrators go in and actually void this. So this, for example, this is a transaction that maybe for whatever reason was not a violation. Um, and there's a bunch of different reasons that might be. It might be a duplicate entry. It might be that they used the wrong credit card and it actually was, you know, came from their own business. There wasn't, it wasn't a business expense, whatever it might be. Um, these can now be updated um, as, you know, no longer a violation. And so that no longer counts against that individual uh, in uh, that weekly or in that monthly metric. So, you know, every month they're coming in, they're meeting with these individuals. They have the ability to keep track of the event. They can, you know, log an email or an interview, and this all becomes part of that historical record. So when they need to evidence to the regulators that, hey, we're trying really hard to administer this, they've got that evidence. And so I like to share this example because it is like a fully, you can really start to see the business process that we're trying to inform here. These are, you know, weekly meetings with the salespeople and, and as and when these exceptions need to be cleared, they can just do that real time. And so they're able to really have a dialogue with those users driven by the data that's coming from the dashboard with this bigger picture conversation. So it's a really powerful business process that we've enabled through extensions. I'm going to share two more. Um, and this next one is close to my heart because, as I said, it's a, a supply chain example. Um, and so this is a commodity, uh, you know, farming commodities in the U.S. And so there's a lot of different farms that ship product to different plants. Uh, and so for the, for the super nerds among us, this is being driven by a linear programming model under the hood which is a really popular way of evaluating supply chain costs. And, but it's, you know, it's not the type of math that we're gonna get done in a Tableau function. And so what we're able to do here uh, is actually start to affect this network. This is supply chain network and we can start to run what if analyses against this to say what happens if we start uh, affecting plants. And so this is a really common exercise that we do with our clients to evaluate like, hey, if I build a new asset or this asset ramps down, what are gonna be the future implications on my transportation costs? These are not simple questions to answer. Yeah, there you go, James. So effectively what we have here 
is the ability to parameterize the model right from the dashboard. So we can ask the question of like, okay, this facility, what happens if I close this one and ramp this one up? So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna um, have to balance the equation, so I'll do that. So what I'm doing is I wanna run this analysis and if I close that facility and reopen this one, what happens? So I'm gonna test this. And it's going to run that linear programming and output that data to a database that is what's connected to these dashboards. So we're then able to see the implication of that um, of that analysis. So that's a really powerful tool. The number to keep an eye on is 659. Uh, that's the current rate of what it costs to move the product on average. Drum roll. So there's, as you can see, there's a decent amount going on behind the hood to, to solve this ana analysis, and our rate actually went up. So behind the, you know, behind the scenes, we've run that linear programming model, and we've pushed through to a database that now updates our Tableau dashboard. And this is a tool we can hand over to our users so that they can start to ask those types of what-if questions themselves to start to get a handle on where might there be opportunities, or if I do need to, if I want to, you know, secure a new producer in this part of the country that's going to produce a ton of products, like what's that going to do to my supply chain costs? We're now able to answer that question and more than that, to give them a tool to answer that question. And that's, uh, so So this is an example of us basically, as I said, parameterizing a model that's running in uh, in Python uh, that then we can, we can see the results of. Um, this last one is one of our favorites. Uh, it's a very similar idea, but uh, this is a Tableau dashboard that has us, um, looks great on a phone when you can actually snap a photo, but we're going to upload an image to this. I'm going to open this, and it's going to, so it's an image of my cat, uh, the, the, the nice one, um, and it's going to run a image processing model to see uh, what this thing is. Okay, so we know it thinks this is probably a tabby cat, got that right. Uh, and we can evaluate like why that model thought that, like what are the areas in that image that the model focused on in order to make that determination. So again, you know, we're, we're the yeah, Annabelle, isn't that always the case? Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is a, you know, it's kind of a fun uh, use case where again, we're, we're, we're taking a model that's running in the background and uh, letting people right from that dashboard do something with that to, to inject that image. So those are just a couple of flyover examples. Um, I hope I hope those are somewhat interesting. I think we'll uh, talk a little bit more about what's going on now before I get into a little bit of show and tell. So as we're building these dashboards, we're always thinking about this cycle of how are we writing that data back and what are we going to do with that. So you know, first we want to generate insight in our dashboard. Then we want our user to make a decision, uh, and most often that decision is going to be. Uh, you know, in the form of uh, them completing a form, providing a, a, a little bit more information to us. And then we're going to persist that data somewhere. Where that data persisted is, is going to really depend on the data source that we're interacting with. It could be one of a million different things. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's why, uh, you know, having an extension framework that you can customize to your use case is so important. And we do this using Anvil X. So uh, it's the product I mentioned earlier that is a pure Python uh, web development framework. And so this has worked really well for us, again, because it abstracts a lot of the pain of, of what would be more of a traditional web development. Um, and as we'll see, it's got like a drag and drop UI builder and is at the end of the day purely in Python. And so that's a little wacky for those of you with some background on that. Running Python in the client is not typically how it's done, but that is what's happening here, and that's sort of what um, what enables a lot of this is having client having Python running in the client and having Python running in the server. So what that means is when you're building your extension, you just have to think Python, you just have to speak Python to get it done. So you know, more getting a little bit more into the weeds uh, as Tableau is running this dashboard. Uh, it's exposing through that uh, that through that API a bunch of stuff that's going on in that dashboard. It might be when somebody makes a selection, or it might be you just want to go get the different data sources. I'll get a little more into this as we look at the uh, at, at the at a demo. But Tableau is enabling this through the exposition of all of those different handles that the dashboard might offer. 
And then Anvil is running Python code that lets us interact with that. Uh, and so that interaction might be responding to the selection that someone makes, or it might be setting filters, setting highlights on the dashboard, refreshing data sources, kind of whatever you might do as a user, you can do uh, in Python as a, from the extension side too. So what, here's what I want to leave you with from Anvil X. Anvil X is not an extension. Uh, you know, I've just shared four different extensions, and you, I think you probably got a flavor that they're pretty different. Uh, they're all built in Anvil X. Uh, and so that's the key is Anvil X is a way of building extensions with just Python. Uh, it can be run for free in desktop using um, their anvil.works slash X. Uh, so that's another link that I'll dump into the chat. Or NL, do you, would you be able to dump that in for me so I don't have to try to copy it out? Um, thank you. And uh, it's not the only way to build extensions for those you know, with a, with a bias towards JavaScript. Everything that I'm talking about here will be equally relevant. Uh, it's just you know, we're, we're talking Python because that's what I know. So uh, in general, write back is a hairy topic. Uh, and you know, we work with a lot of uh, folks with strong IT groups that, that this puts their hackles up in a pretty serious way. Um, and so what I want to reinforce is that when we think about write back, we're usually thinking about updating source data. Um, and that is usually very challenging to do because there's a huge amount of risk that comes with that. And, and most of the time, that's actually a non-starter for us. So many of the examples that I'm going to share or that I have shared and, and what, we'll, what we'll demo is this idea of enriching the data by creating a parallel data set that you can then manage. Uh, and that sort of de-risks it because you're not touching your source data. You're just creating a second data set that it allows you to enrich that. That might be enriching it through comments like that JAT extension, um, or it might be enriching it through, uh, you know, uh, write back through or through like an override. And I'll give an example of that. But key idea is that we can really create a lot of value from extensions by enriching the data without modifying source data, which is um, which, which is a, a powerful technique that, I, that I'll talk about and share. So how do we do it? How do we go and build an Anvil X extension? I think generally, we first thing we need to do is identify the use case. So you know, what is the story? What, what is it that we need people to be able to do? And what is that decision point that we want to inform? Next, we need to decide on a storage mechanism. So are we going to update our data? Are we going to enrich the data? Um, or are we going to layer it in as like a separate data set sort of alongside the source data like I talked about? Then we have to build the capture form. Then we've got to tie it into the dashboard. Usually when someone makes a selection, we want to show them something. And then we need to write your write back function and blend in the new data. So we're going to do that. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, Anvil here. So when you first set up Anvil, you'll come here. As I said, you can get started with the Tableau chat extension. Uh, this is like fully baked, ready to be plopped into your dashboard. Um, and it'll give you a little bit of a way to get started. We're, we're not going to do that today. But um, that's you know a great way to get started if you're doing this for the first time. Um, I'm going to start with this dashboard that I've already uh, built. And what this is, is it's a dashboard uh, that lets us layer in some targets to our Superstore. So I'm going to jump over here. And here's, again, our Superstore dashboard. Uh, and what we have is this new form. I can click Set Targets. And this is going to pull up um, all of the different sales targets that have been set by state. So I've already built this. But the idea here is that I can now create a new data set that lets us set uh, state-specific targets. I kind of sometimes think about this as like super parameters. I can have a parameter that's state-specific as opposed to needing to like have a single target across the board. I've now got targets that are configurable and settable. I can you know, modify this as I go um, in order to uh, make those updates. And that's um, tied into our dashboard. Uh, so what's going on there if I cut back over to Anvil? Um, this is Anvil. So if I just give a quick flyover, on the left, I see uh, the different modules. I've got a home page that probably looks pretty familiar. It's going to be the same that's here. Uh, and so this is the drag and drop UI. Um, behind that is code. So you know it's running pure Python. Um, and I'll talk through this a little bit. Uh, I see we have our T-Rex jacket. And what that means is I can say, like, hey, get dashboard. 
and this is going to pop up uh, the information uh, that tells me like what can I do with this thing. So get dashboard is just going to get that Python representation of our dashboard. And if I period here, I see all the different things I can do. So I can get the data sources, I can get the filters, I can get a worksheet by name, I can get the name of the dashboard, I can get all my parameters, I can refresh data sources, all the different stuff that I would typically need to do. Again, there's now like these, these methods that I can call to start get taking, taking that action. Um, in this case, there's already some stuff that's going on. I see I'm registering an event handler for the selection change. And then I'm, I've got a function. So basically what that means is I've defined this function here. So anytime a user clicks on a, makes a selection, so clicks on something in the dashboard, I'm gonna do something. In this case, all I'm gonna do is print uh, what got selected. So when that, so if I come over here and I click on Colorado, I have this Tableau output that is, oh, I need, might need to refresh. New Mexico. Well, should be showing New Mexico here. Let's try reloading my window. All right. So we see that worksheet cell map had a following mark selected, Colorado, and so. You know, this is a really powerful part of, of this is we can now, just by printing what's going on, we start to get that real real time feedback in terms of what's going on on our dashboard. So as we're trying to build different uh, tools and different aspects of this dashboard or as different as I want to build out this extension, this is a pretty powerful way to start to just know what's going on. Um, and so we'll come back to that, but that's a really, uh, that's a really useful feature as we're starting to get a handle on what's going on. And, getting our head around it. Next are these data tables. So right now we've got this targets data table, which is um, what we were actually modifying earlier. Uh, and so what this is, is it's, a, it's underneath the, under the hood, there's a Postgres database, but we can really quickly create new tables. And so, you know, for example, if we wanted to create a new table um, that was like, I don't know, uh, well, let's just make variants reasons to, um, I can create, sorry, this is in table four. I can now add columns. Maybe I need to know my state uh, and I need to know my reason. And I'm just adding columns and these columns are all going to be available. Uh, this data set is now available to us as a data source in Tableau. So you're probably starting to see where that next step is, is I'm starting to build this data source. We've already actually got one, variance reasons or variance explanations, which is gonna give us our state, the explanation, the timestamp and a reason that might get picked. So we're so this is that idea of building these new tables uh, that let us are, that can then be connected to from uh, Tableau to, to really start to pair. And this is the idea, right? We have this uh, primary key on the state and we can now keep track of the variance explanation uh, based on that state uh, and pull that in as a regular data source. So Graham, yeah, that's exactly right. Adding a new table, created a new table in Postgres, creating new columns adds new columns in Postgres. Those are then you know exposed to uh, Tableau. Really powerful. Um, so what do we want to do? Uh, we said that we wanted to. How we've got these targets on all of our different dashboards, and we see that we've got some sales variants here, negative 945, and we want to start getting reasons for this. Let's get our users help this for, let's get our users to tell us what happened. And so I'm going to go back to my homepage, and we're going to create a UI. Uh, if I go back to my design process, that's exactly what I said we were going to do. Um, and so we can pull in different labels here. So maybe we'll say state and we want another label for the state. Uh, as I'm dragging these in, you'll notice this like label three. This is what it's called in Python. So we want to call it something useful. We'll call it label state. Um, and maybe let's give people a drop down to tell us what happened. Like why was uh, why did this variance exist? 
Uh, and uh, if folks could throw some reasons that are there might be a sales variance in the chat. Um, one of my favorites from another presentation I gave was uh, interest rates changing. But uh, if anyone else got any uh, reasons they can think of about why uh, this would be, why variance might occur. Uh, maybe we'll all just use customer, lost, um, I don't know, successful campaign, supply chain blockage, love it. So we've got all, we've got a, we've defined a couple of different reasons that will show up in our drop down. Um, and I'm going to include a placeholder so it's not defaulted. So I've started to craft this UI. And uh, you know what? Let's give a save button here, too. And we want to see what's going on. So let's cut back to our Tableau dashboard. And I'm going to reload it. Too much inventory. So I see here that that UI that we've created is, is you know, it's showing up in our dashboard. So that's kind of what I was getting out about this drag and drop UI. Uh, rather than having to mess with, with you know, components and code, it's more like Tableau. We get to drag and drop and build that UI, build that form that's whatever we need it to be uh, so that we can now capture that information from the users. And we see those different reasons that we got are, are listed now here. So the next thing we want to do is respond to that selection event so that we can actually keep track of those reasons. So I'm going to move pretty quickly here in the interest of time. Um, but there's two things we want to do. First, we want to capture the state when someone makes a selection. So we're going to go self.labelState.text. We're going to get our event.getSelectedMarks. And we know that it is called the state province. I'm just going to copy that. Um, we actually have to take our first mark. It's possible more than one was selected. And when someone clicks save, we want to um, save that as a reason. So we're going to create a new event handler. There is a theme. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, there's a new Python function we've defined that will get called whenever somebody clicks that button. Uh, and we want that one to add a reason to the reasons table. So we can go app tables, which is going to access uh, those tables we added. We're going to go variance, reasons, and we're going to add a row. So the state is going to be self.label state uh, dot text. And the reason is going to be our drop down selected value. I know I'm moving really fast, but I'm running a little short on time. Uh, and that's it. So if I reload this now, let's see if I got this right. We can go to North Carolina. We see it popped up North Carolina as part because we added that to our selection event. And we want to say that there was a supply chain blockage. And we'll save that. So if we flip back to our reasons table here, uh, oops. we see, sure enough, North Carolina has a supply chain blockage. And that's going to be in that data source that exists in Tableau. So I'm, I'm short on time. Suffice to say, um, that is a data source. And so I've used a cross-database uh, blend to pull in that reason. Um, and so if this variance reason is now available, and would be shown in this dashboard if, if we, if you know, it, it's it's just another data source at the end of the day. It's just that that data source is now configurable and customizable by our users from, from the dashboard. So that is a very quick flyover. Um, I hope I have convinced you that extensions are for you. Uh, I really uh, welcome you to, to reach out with any other questions as you're diving in. Um, really keen to keep talking about this. Anvil's got a ton more capabilities I didn't really get to talk about, but they're you know they're they're enterprise ready. Um, in terms of um, how you can get started, I really think there's nothing better than than trying it out. So as I said, download that, uh, get yourself an account, set up a chat extent or a chat extension in your dashboard, uh, and you can start to configure that. It's a good starting point. And that T-Rex jacket that I shared earlier. 
really is going to be um, a great place to start. It's got some good guides and tutorials. Um, there's some case studies here. Otherwise, uh, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably where I'm most active. Also on GitHub where the TRX jacket exists. Um, and you can uh, access some of the more information and tutorials there. Uh, I'll be at TC, so if anyone else is able to make it, um, I'm going to be talking more about this. And, and uh, generally, would love to, to meet all of you. Um, I kind of was blind to questions during that. Uh, where is the data created? So yeah, the data created um, lives wherever your Anvil is hosted. So for us, our firm is kind of risk adverse, or at least uh, we're pretty tight. So we hope we have an enterprise instance of, of Anvil. So it's all in our private cloud. If you're using Anvil's uh, SaaS offering, it's kind of like Tableau Cloud versus Tableau Server, where your data exists depends on, it's kind of up to you. Um, what is the data security? Yeah, so Matthew, I think that's probably a similar question. If if you're in a pretty regulated environment, it's almost in, it's almost sure that you're going to need an enterprise instance that you lives in your private cloud. That's our boat for the same reason. We just can't. We we are not allowed to to touch data that's not in our infrastructure. Um, uh, Annabelle, I, I think I'm at time probably. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone's it's question. Okay. You know, we can, we can extend like two or three minutes if you have time. I mean, one question was, uh, can you limit the ability to write back to some of the dashboard users? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we, I don't, most of our dashboards use like role, role, uh, role based permissioning. Um, and so I think that um, you can, the world's your oyster, you know, I think I never really got into the security side, but um anvil when you know you're writing server code or client code i, I covered client code today um but when you're writing server code it's it's <clears throat> server it's so it's you know you can securely impose whatever types of restrictions you need to do and um it's really important then that you uh impose the types of restrictions that's where you can like if you know when your users are logged in you can control what access they have based on who they are um and those types of things some more we can go to review some of the examples. Graham, I really, yeah, I mean, I would really encourage you to, to just download the, um, or to go to anvil.works slash X and download one of those chat extensions to get started. I think that's going to be the best way to, then it's like your own, you know what I mean? You're not, it, it, it's, you create your own instance of that app and can kind of test it out. But if you're, not great. otherwise, you know, we're very, very happy to run sessions with organizations that are interested to, to do a little bit more of a hands-on tutorial and don't hesitate to reach out. It's the short answer there. Yeah, Emmanuel, that's absolutely something we've done in the past. That's uh, right. well. Thank you very, thank you very much, everybody. If there's any other questions, please do send me an email. Um, and uh, really appreciate everyone's time today. That was fun. Thank you very much, Daniel, and uh, we will see each other in TC. Awesome. And if any of you are in TC, please uh, come and say hello. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> we always appreciate. Shimdi, are you going to make it at TC? So we'll see. I'm fully booked and registered and everything, but I'm waiting for like one piece of documentation. Mm. So we'll see. But I'm, I'm hoping that I would be able to. <laughs> yeah. So do not miss our next Tableau user group. It will be just before PC, and we will um, uh, host uh, only you know, one thematic, but a group of speakers. It will be Japanese uh, um, ambassador and visionaries, and they come with a very, very funny game. So I'm sure that you will love it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much uh, to our speaker, to our audience, and I wish you a very beautiful long weekend. <laughs> thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.